Michel Pelcher, who is a local resident. Uh, he is representing the Canadian Bankers Association. Uh, his professional experience, he's a senior executive who's been involved in planning, marketing, general management, information technology, primarily in financial services, had a major role in several acquisitions and mergers, also held senior positions in the telecommunications and transportation business. He was, he was an ombudsman for the Laurentian Bank, acting as a facilitator and mediator to resolve client disputes, formerly a co-chief operating officer for the B2B Trust and Executive Vice President of Laurentian Bank for Agency Banking, Insurance and Visa, Chairman of the IT Users Group and member of the Credit Committee. He played a leading role at Laurentian Bank for the integration of North America Trust and an acquisition for Sun Life Trust leading to the creation of the B2B Trust named 2002 into Financial Institution of the Year at the Quebec Finance Grand Prix Awards. Member of Task Force charged with combining Laurentian Financial and Desjardins Life Insurance. Subsequently appointed Senior Vice President Quebec Individual Network for newly created Desjardins Laurentian Life Group. While at Laurentian Financial held the following positions. President and CEO. Laurentian Imperial President, Placement La Laurentien, a Senior Vice President, Marketing, Laurentian Life. And he's born in Ottawa. He resides in Beaconfield with his wife, Nicole. They have three sons and four grandchildren. And his interests are mobile technology and financial modeling. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Michel to come up and make his presentation. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, financial abuse. And uh, I would recommend strongly that uh, there's a leaflet outside and that you get that because it'll summarize a lot of what we're, I'm talking about this afternoon. First, looking at uh, who the abusers are. We're talking about family abusers, financial abusers. Family members are probably number one on the list. Um, caregiver for senior citizens or in residences. Nurse could be or a staff nursing uh, at a staff nursing home, a neighbor or an acquaintance. I'll give you examples later on, and I think we've, we've had one before here. And uh, service providers. Just to give you some real life cases, uh, this is from the Canadian bankers. They pull this one out, and the names are changed, but they're real life cases. So Julia, her husband died, and uh, her grandson was a big help. She broke her ankle, and consequently was uh, immobile. So he ran to the bank. Uh, do some, she, essentially she did all his, her, errors, her uh, errands. She paid, he paid the bills, went to the, get the groceries, anything, pharmaceutical, pharmacy uh, uh, things she needed. And soon enough, um, she, um, she went to the bank for her, and uh, before you know it, there was not enough money in the bank. So we can guess what happened there. He was withdrawing some of her money, obviously. And uh, another case uh, was Randall. An 85-year-old widower, living alone, he hired a local handyman, Eric, to fix his le leaky faucet. So something very mundane to start off with. Eric then convinced him that his home needed a host of repairs. And uh, they kept getting more expensive. Soon, uh, Randall kept giving him more and more to do, and it was more and more expensive. And... Um, then uh, he started uh, saying, look, Eric, and maybe we can diminish some of this stuff and maybe we don't need to do all of it. And uh, guess what? Eric got, uh, got a little angry. And Randall was afraid to say anything because if uh, Eric left, I mean, he was left in the lurch. So Eric, before you know it, had his keys to his home and he came and went as he pleased. And Randall's at the point where he didn't know what to do. Now, they don't say the rest of the story, but it just shows you that how gradually uh, Randall got caught in and, uh, and someone took advantage of him. Another person, Anton, he had lived in, his, in the same house for 50 years. His memory started to fade and he missed some bill payments. So his nephew suggested a power of attorney, uh, allowing him to pay bills and write checks. Now, uh, afterwards, his nephew put his house up for sale without his permission. 
I mean, those are, that is really bad, bad abuse. So financial abuse, as you can see, it's someone who wants to take control of your assets, money, property, or personal information. Could be a stranger, family member, or friend. Now, it's all unethical, but it's not always illegal. So um, that's uh, something to remember. They target anyone, but seniors are very vulnerable. Find it resources, fixed income, and they're, in many cases, they're dependent because they're isolated. And it's usually related to money or health. You have examples where uh, there is pressure to sign documents. That would be a red flag anytime uh, if anyone's trying to get into your accounts and they say to you, well, you gotta do this today or something's gonna happen. And uh, other examples are a contractor wanting to do work without quote. Because there you don't have a maximum and uh, before you know it, there's more and more that's added on and uh, it's more, more costly. Other forms of abuse. Theft of money or property, forging signatures, legal or financial documents, and that happens. Uh, exerting pressure to sign, which I just mentioned. Tricking, tricking or forcing someone to sign. In other words, they wouldn't normally have to sign, but they're made to sign something and not realizing what they're doing because maybe uh, the memory is not as good as it used to be. Uh, refusal to return your property. Now, this can be a friend or a family uh, member, i.e., uh, an example is uh, they borrow your car, never give it back to you. So um, that's almost like stealing, but it certainly is abuse. Service providers, overcharging, doing unnecessary work, money up front, and the work incomplete. Now, um, I have another example here that I mentioned three earlier on, and this is personal in our family. My aunt, Gabi, who was in her mid-80s, in living in the Rubiel Zulu, so it's not a very big city, it's more like, almost like a village, 5,000 people, she uh, was caught driving in a wrong direction and down a one-way street. So uh, lucky no accidents, but also no more driver's license. So uh, she was pretty much left on her own devices. Uh, she was living in, in an apartment but she couldn't do much, but she did meet someone 20 years younger than her, she was 88, and they developed a good friendship. Now, this is in our family. Soon she was taking him to dinner, several dinners, good restaurants, of course, she was paying for it. And uh, my dad, who had the power of attorney, saw this, but he said, well, you know, these are her final years, she has no friends, and uh, they're all gone anyway, so she's entitled to have fun. And, uh, and to live a little bit. So he let it pass. And, uh, but the next thing you know, because she said, he said, she's entitled to some good companionship. After that, she started buying him gifts. And he asked to have his car repaired. Well, it was repaired for the cost of $10,000. So that was the last straw. And uh, he never returned, because I think my father laid the law down. So, uh, that can happen anywhere. I mean, we weren't expecting that. So what do you do if you suspect financial abuse? Talk to someone. Talk to someone you trust. Now, if it's your banker, as we were talking about earlier, and you can have a good relationship with a the banker, then you, you bring it up and see what can be done. Obviously, if someone's going into your account, the banker will make sure that you and you only, or someone that you delegate, that you designate, that you have confidence in, then they'll take care of that. Uh, but a lot of people are embarrassed to talk about it. So that's a bit more difficult. But telling someone is your first step in stopping the abuse, because otherwise if you don't do anything, like we had the case with Anton, it's, or Randall rather, it's not good. It just keeps on going. You can get help. You can call your local police, contact your lawyer, or local senior center to, to find out how, what, you, what you can do. Talk to your bank, financial institution, if someone is misusing your credit cards, let your bank know. They can shut down that activity fairly quickly. What are the red flags of financial abuse? You own characters, are short of money and bills are not being paid. And this is something that you didn't have before. Perhaps you have been asked to create a joint account with someone that you don't know very well. So clearly there's a red flag there. Someone who knows 
who wants to move in but refuses to pay rent. Well, that's a problem because they're moved in and you're not getting paid or the person's not getting paid. How do you evict them? You know, they, they seem to have one day. It's like having a free key to come in whenever they want. You're being pressured to change the beneficiary of power of attorney. That often happens, and I've witnessed that again in a family, a close family, where um, one, of the, uh, one of the beneficiaries saw that his father was losing his capacity and he wanted to get power of attorney, pretty much on his own. So uh, that was stopped in time. But if it doesn't get stopped in time, that is, ends up by being abuse. You're missing money from bank accounts or you find unauthorized transactions on your credit card statements. Well, that's certainly a, a, a key of uh, abuse. Items missing from your home. Who hasn't seen that? It's happened uh, when my mother was in a nursing home. She lost some diamonds. She lost, uh, well, she didn't lose them. They disappeared. And this is in a nursing home which was reputed, but you don't have any proof. But that's still abuse. Contractor that you hire is charging you and uh, charging you more than what he said he would. You don't have any proof to, the, to that effect because there was no contract. Um, press used to make unnecessary repairs to your home, which we had in the case earlier on. And um, finally here in this case, there are, you are being pressured to sign documents that you don't understand. And that's not too difficult these days with some of the documents, the way they're uh, heavily in the legalese. Financial abuse is not your fault, so you can get help. Now, where to get help is in the back of this. This, I, I really encourage you to get that. This should, should be enough on front. And uh, there's all the numbers here that go by by province. And uh, again, again, this is, it finishes off by saying, talk to the police or talk to, talk to your banker. So I'm up, for, ready for questions. Um, apparently you didn't mention Bitcoin nor PayPal, which is recognized as the safest electronic payment secure system. Okay, well, um, PayPal has been in business for quite a while. In fact, it was co-founded by uh, a Canadian out west. And uh, I haven't heard anything bad about PayPal, but if someone gets your account and has your password, then you're in trouble. So, but the operation from PayPal itself is, Jeff Knowles is the person I was thinking, it was Jeff Scholes. He's a multi-billionaire, lives in Canada, and uh, was one of the co-founders of PayPal. So it's a legit business. But, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of retailers use that, and uh, it's, very wide, it's very widely used. So I wouldn't say anything bad about, Bit, about uh, PayPal. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is another, another, another animal. Bitcoin has been used originally for a lot of transactions, mainly uh, drugs cr and um, criminal activities. It's not all like that, but it's, uh, it's a bit shaky. There's different kinds of Bitcoins. There are different names for Bitcoins. And uh, what you should know is that nobody really knows who started this. It's a Japanese name, and they credit that person, I can't even pronounce it, for having invented the uh, the Bitcoin. It's based on an algorithm of complex mathematical question, uh, formulas that once you figure out what they are, and these are math mathematics and computer scientists that work on, on uh, what's known as um, mining. Mining means that when they get the answer to the problem, they get so many coins. And then those coins go out in circulation. Bitcoin per se, can, there ne can never be more than 21 million of them. I would pretty much stay away from that uh, because it's, it's not regulated and uh, even the banks have, are being looking at this or some derivative of Bitcoin because it's based on what's known as a blockchain, which means that every single transaction is in a big ledger somewhere. And the advantage of that 
is that there is only one ledger, uh, contrary to when in most businesses where you can say, well, he's got a ledger, the other person's got a ledger for transactions, and they may not match. But a blockchain, everything matches. However, there are been errors and there have been hacks, so uh, it is nowhere near a mature for the average person to use. I have a question, Michelle. Uh, we very seldom have, or we don't have that many tellers uh, at the bank, which was the personal contact. The, they got to know you the same as Canada Post. The postman got to know you and your habits, and the police on the beat. And we can go on and on what the, we've lost. A lot of people do their banking at the machine. And let's say you have a family member, nephew, son, whatever who is intimidating you, threatening you, conning you, whatever term you want to give it, who's at the bank machine with you and says, well, take out an extra thousand, take out an extra 500. There's no way that that can be spotted. Uh, well, the person would know, <laughs> obviously, if she's being pressured to, he or she's being pressured to take out more than, uh, than uh, it was required. Um, I guess it goes back to get to know your bank manager uh, you're, you're right. Uh, tellers are viewed as an expense and more and more tellers are being uh, encouraged to become financial advisors. So upgrade their education because if you look at what the bank does, the bank essentially makes money. It's an intermediary that likes to have as much wealth, your wealth, and manage it for you and there is some good effect in that and that you do get some uh, economies of scale. See, the first thing a bank, if you person gets married, um, they probably have a bank account, but when it comes time to getting a mortgage, they shop around, because uh, we're talking big money here. So when they shop around and, 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 and choose a financial institution that provides them with a mortgage and conditions that they can live with, then the next thing that the bank will try and do, and uh, I think it's sort of natural, is try and establish a relationship, give the person a credit card, maybe even a line of credit on the mortgage or separate from the mortgage. And then before you know it, uh, then there's investment products. There's GICs, maybe there's mutual funds, maybe they meet the brokerage arm. So the idea is to develop a relationship with that financial institution. So if that, this is what banks are aiming for, is to get the broad market, of get the, uh, the portfolio, the person's portfolio, and manage it. Manage it well for as much as they can, obviously. And depends on know, and know your client. That's another thing too. It's if you deal with a financial institution and you're dealing with a, a financial advisor that doesn't check your know your client. It's a form that they fill out and are required to to review it every year with you because maybe your uh, risks profile varies. You know, if you've inherited something, maybe you can go into something a little bit risky because it's not money you need. But that's supposed to be reviewed every year with a financial advisor. So if that's not being done, that's a bit of a red flag. Because as you go on, you could put it, be put into uh, uh, products that are a little too risky for you. Especially as you, uh, as you get older, it's harder to follow some of these products. So to answer the question, yes, tellers are uh, pretty much not a, a growing area. Uh, we see that that type of transaction being done automatically. It could be done by robots. You'd never know the difference between uh, when you're online, the question and answer that goes on, versus a teller that's right there. I mean, uh, when I started out in banking, there were personal banks that uh, someone would walk in, and it was your birthday. Someone would come, you know, they'd come in and give you a flower, a rose. I don't see that anymore. <laughs> Another question for you. Another question for you. Um, you can have a mandate uh, for your health care, for your housing or residence needs, medical, and you can also have for your financial needs. So you can have named somebody as a power of attorney, I yes. guess, is the proper term. Um, does the bank ever ask, I'm the client, and I have a power of attorney of my daughter, let's say, for my affairs. Right. Does my bank manager ever ask me, could we meet with your power of attorney, your daughter, whatever, whatever, so that there is some kind of a relationship developed? Uh, yes, and I can say uh, I have a case close to, uh, to home. 
My wife is a, a liquidator for uh, one of the liquidators for uh, her father, and they're very interested. In, uh, he deals with a few, uh, mainly two financial institutions, and they wanted to see him. They wanted to see her, and um, develop a, con a conversation there in the link. So yes, I think uh, I don't have any personal experience where it, it hasn't been done right. I've seen uh, one institution where we didn't necessarily she didn't get along with the the person there and. Uh, but that's a personality thing more than a functional thing. So, um, well, a short yeah. answer would be is if somebody has this kind of an arrangement with a family member, yeah. would be to have a meeting with your bank manager yes. and introduce the member of your family who you've given power of attorney to handle your financial matters. Yes, that's right. Now, there's another thing that came to mind is that uh, some of the residencies, uh, and this is where my father was, father in law. Uh, the bank came twice a week. They had an office. The residents would give them an office, the residents. And then uh, that person would stay there, and that was like a bank branch. So they would meet the, the needs for the people. They didn't have to go to the bank. That's lovely. It's how do I know? Yeah. Uh, and, and would like to just mention something about powers of attorney. Right. Yeah. Do you want to come up? Yeah. No, just a very quick, quick remark. Um, uh, the abuse of a power of attorney, that's someone who oversteps or mismanages under a power of attorney, which is only for finances. People often think, I've got the power of attorney and it extends to health care and everything. It's only for finances, only when you're capable. But when it comes to somebody who's abused their power of attorney, really used it to buy an expensive car, I mean, an outrageous expense that you see that a family member, usually it's a family member, has exceeded their power. People will call the police, but the police have no jurisdiction. It's not a criminal matter, it's a civil matter. So it gets to be very, very frustrating that you take your time to do it. Sometimes the police, the socio-communal care police, will come in and they'll speak to the person and inquire, and they're acting as peace officers in that regard. But they are not, it is not a criminal matter, although people say that's criminal, but it, it is a civil matter. So certainly look to speak to a lawyer, and there are many, many clinics around where you can get some basic information. And there is, of course, always our clinic in terms of getting some information, basic information on that. The other thing is that we really encourage banks to know the client, and the client is the underlying client, the one who named that person under the power of attorney. And uh, when you see that, when the bank sees that there is something unusual, and we hope that banks are tracking some unusual transactions, that they call the client, their client, and ask that client, uh, does this make sense to you? Is this work with your planning that you have in place? Why don't you come in? Very, very often the answer from the client at that point is, what, um, what are you talking about? So the person has already diminished and has the control over this person's money has been taken over by the person who's acting under the power of attorney. And, and these unusual transactions start occurring. So really the banks have to be far, and they're very helpful. But we really encourage them to know their client better by calling the actual client. And then they can put a stop, they can put a freeze on the account. And they're very helpful in that regard, but not consistent across the board. So we really have to remind them that this is something that they can do to help us. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, Michelle, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.